Good morning. Good morning, morning. I bring you greetings from the Greater Emmanuel Baptist Church. I'm Sister Pam Taylor, and I'm here to do the Sunday School Overview. Right. Our lesson topic today comes from Unit 1, God Requires Justice. It's the subtopic, and the topic is the mercy of justice. Coming from 2 Samuel chapter 9, 1 through 7, and it commences at 9 through 12. All right. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Father God, as again we come this morning, Lord, just to say thank you. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you for being so good to us. We thank you, Lord, for last night lying down and early morning rising this morning. We thank you, Lord, for breath in our body and the activity of our limbs, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for watching over us and keeping us, Lord, as we went about our daily goings all this week and on yesterday. We thank you for the opportunity to come back into your house, Lord, and uh, share your word. Father, we just thank you for provision, protection, and your peace, Lord. Father, we lift up to you right now those who are hurting, Lord, those who have Amen. illnesses in their bodies, Lord. Amen. Those, Lord, who have lost their loved ones, Lord, we just ask and pray that you would comfort them as only you can. Uh, we ask and pray that you bless the great Emmanuel Baptist Church family, Lord, in all that we do, Lord, for the glory of you, Lord. We just ask and pray, Lord, as we continue our search of a replacement pastor, Lord, that you would guide us, Lord, in, in the right way. Father, we ask and pray that you would uh, trust the man who's going to bring your message this morning, Lord, that he would speak a word that will pierce our hearts that someone may come and ask, what shall I do to be saved? Right. And as we open up this lesson today, Lord, we just ask and pray that you would show us, as using David as an example, how to show mercy and justice yeah. at the same time. Father, we... Uh, and lest we forget, Lord, please forgive us for all sins, known and unknown, Lord, and let us be a vessel of Thank you. you. These, and bless, all, these and other blessings that we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen and amen. Today is a very familiar subject. Um, it talks about David and, uh, and how before he came unto his kingship, how he endured a lot of things. Uh, yeah. just to uh, get to his kingship. Um, and there's two words in this lesson today that really points, uh, stands out uh, for me, and that was mercy and justice. Uh -huh. As we know, mercy is the undeserved favor of yeah. God. Uh -huh. Withholding punishment that we really deserve. And justice, we see, is dispensing deserved punishment for doing wrong. Uh -huh. uh, so we see in the story today, uh, David had to endure a lot of that. Uh, but he was a man of God, and uh, despite all the uh, obstacles he went through and the things that, uh, that wasn't in his favor, he ended up on time. So as we get into this lesson, um, Let's just be mindful of if someone do you wrong, you don't have to get even. Right. Just let God handle it because yeah. He said vengeance is mine. Uh -huh. Amen. Um, so, as uh, let's go ahead and read the lesson uh, plan. One one through seven says, and David said, "Is there any yet?" I'm sorry, David. And David said, "Is there yet any left?" of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was the house of Saul, a servant named Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant he is. Is he? And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show kindness of the house of Saul, kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan had yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king David, 
Behold, he is in the house of Mishkar, the son of Aniel, of in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mishkar, the son of Aniel, from Lodabar. Now when Moshibeth, now he was dead, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David. He fell on his face and did reference. And David said, Moshibeth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Joshua thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, which is actually his grandfather. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continuously. Amen. And then 9 through 12 commence reading this. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I am given unto thee, my, thy master's son, all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Mm -hmm. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruit that thy master's son may have food to eat. Excuse <coughs> me. But most Mesimophit, thy master's son shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, and said the king, He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. In verse 12, And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. And that's the ending of our scripture. Right. Um, now to uh, actually get into this lesson and find out what was going on during that time, kind of, kind of go back some okay. uh, yep. to a few chapters uh -huh. uh, verses uh, prior. So, we know that 1 Samuel was written by the prophet Samuel uh, up into chapter 25 when his death occurred. 2 Samuel, uh, the continuation of it, was written by the, Nathan, uh, the prophet Nathan and uh, Gad okay. after the death of Samuel. Right. We see in this chapter, David was the son of Jesse, the youngest of eight sons right. from the tribe of Judah. In this chapter, David wishes to extend his mercy to the house of Saul, fulfilling his covenant promise to Saul and Jonathan. Mm -hmm. uh, we know the story. David was anointed at an age, early age while still watching his father's sheep out in the pasture by Samuel the prophet to be king of Israel. He was a brave lad. While watching after the sheep, he fought lions, bears, and other predators that came to attack the sheep. Come on. He was labeled a, a man after God's own heart. Right. He even fought the Philistine Goliath and defeated him because the other men were afraid of him. With the grace of God, a slingshot, and some smooth stones, mm. he was victorious. Come on. Yeah, yeah. He grew to be a man of war. That's when Saul, who was king at that time, became jealous of David because he was already destined and anointed to be the next king. Uh -huh. He married one of Saul's daughters, Micah, and became Jonathan's, uh, which was Saul's uh, son, his best friend, who was also uh, Saul's son, as I said. They were very loyal to one another. They, they got on like brothers. Right. Um, Jonathan went as far as protecting David from his father Saul. Uh, we see that in 1 Samuel 23 and 18. <clears throat> David said Jonathan swore, David and Jonathan swore to each other in honor, and they kept that honor. Uh -huh. Well, a lot of times we promise something, but uh, mm -hmm. due to certain circumstances, sometimes we may not be able to keep uh, our word. But, they swore 
to one another. They made it oh a pack. You know how back in the day you cut your finger and you cut your finger and you rub your finger together and that's your pack. But they had a pack that they made and they swore to keep to one another. Um, there were many battles happening during that time. And Saul was seeking after David to kill him because he was jealous of him. Uh, you know, the women, the people were saying Saul killed a thousand and David killed ten thousand. So he didn't like that. Yeah. He made a little song about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so he was seeking after David to kill him because of his jealousy. David had taken refuge in different cities and in the wilderness, in caves, hiding from Saul as he pursued him. Right. In 1 Samuel 23 and 18, we see that David came close enough to Saul to do him harm. Mm. Uh, if he really had the hatred in his heart. Mm. But he just cut off a piece of his robe. And later on, he gave down at him and said, Saul, Saul, look. I was close enough to you to do you harm, but I didn't. Because David was very, very humble. He was very humble. Uh, and then again, in 1 Samuel 26, 11, and 12, he was close enough again to him, uh, but he only took his spear and his cruise of water. Right. Now, and then uh, both times, you know, when they were there, they took some men with him. The men wanted him to go ahead and take Saul out. Mm -hmm. But they were told him, I could do no harm to God's anointing. Right. Uh -huh. And you find that in 1 uh, Samuel 20 and 23. Uh, he, and it's also referenced in 1 Chronicles 16 and 22 and Psalms 25 and 15. Uh, it was like God put them in a deep sleep that no one heard or did they awaken while David and his men were there in their camp. Okay. <clears throat> um, and David let Saul know again that I was this near you okay. and I have proof. Okay. I've got your sword and I've got your cruise of water. Okay? Uh -huh. And so Saul was so remorseful for his actions against David that he tells David he was no longer pursue after him but he too asked David to make a covenant with him that after he becomes king that he would not cut off the descendants of the house of Saul. All right. And David agrees. And you'll find that in 1 Samuel 24, 20 and 22. So moving along, uh, 1 Samuel 25, we see Samuel dies and was buried in his house in Ramah. And then uh, Samuel 27, we see David and his men left and went to a Philistine city called Gath and stayed there about a year and four months or something. And and he knew that Saul wouldn't pursue him there. While they were while they were there, they continued to go to battle with the Amalekites and the Jezreites, defeating them. And he also uh, they uh, kidnapped his two of his wives and, and he had to go and uh, retrieve them. And they were victorious in everything that they did. In 1 Samuel 30, when he saw, was so afraid that he felt God had departed from him. And he was no longer protecting him because his enemies were steadily overtaking them. So he went by night to see a sorcerer to bring Samuel from his eternal rest for counseling. Oh, my. <coughs> Samuel scolded him so and told him that David would be king. And on tomorrow, when they go to battle, him and his son would die. He was angry, Saul. Saul was very angry, angry and he was also wary. Um, and then in 1 Samuel 31, final chapter, we see Saul and Jonathan both were killed in battle. When David got word over it, he came back from where he was in the land of the Philistines. And um, and he weeped and grieved over Saul and Jonathan. Um, he rent his clothes and, and, you know, back in the day when people were sorrowful, they tore their clothes out and they put, you know, ashes and, and they wore sackcloth. Right. And that's their way of grieving. Uh -huh. um, so he grieved over them. 
Moses was ever dead for a while. Um, now, moving along, we get to 2 Samuel chapter 2. We see Saul's son named Ishbosheth was appointed king of Israel. Okay. He reigned there about two years right. until his death. All right. David was king over Judah at that time. The uh, the north and the south were in battle against each other. Wow. And eventually, Ephraim was killed. And David became king of all of Israel. All right. The north and the south. Israel and Judah. Um, and you can see that in 2 Samuel uh, 2 and 2. Uh, 2 Samuel 4, we see Jonathan, the son of Mas Jonathan, the son of Mephibosheth, was dropped while fleeing to safety by his nurse, mm -hmm. crippling him at the age of five. So he was lame in both feet. That's how he got lame. Right. They, they were afraid of being seized upon, and she was running, trying to get him to safety, and she dropped him, mm. injuring him pretty bad. In 2 Samuel 5, uh, 5 through 7, we see David had built houses for himself and his family to dwell in. And uh, they, they, everything was going good. And they had troops, which they call a garrison. There was nothing but troops in certain sections of the city protecting them, uh, protecting the cities and the people. They were, at the time, of rest. No more wars and battles. All right. David and the priest went to Obed-Edom's house to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant okay, huh? and returning back to Jerusalem. Okay. <clears throat> and David was sitting up thinking, proposing in his heart, I live in a big, nice, fancy house, a right. cedar, and I'm going to build a temple to put the Ark of the Covenant in uh, to dwell in. But Nathan the prophet advised him that God had other plans. Right, right, right. It would be built by his seed, Solomon, and not him, right. because David was a man of war, uh -huh. and he had blood on his hand. So, moving along in 2 Samuel 8, <clears throat> we see there were plenty of battles. The time of rest was over. It was back to battle. Um, David, went, David and his men, not David alone, went up against the Philistines, the Moabs, the Syrians, the Ammonites, and David sought the Lord, and the Lord gave them victory over all their enemies. Come on, right. Right. Um, and some of the enemies even became servants to David. They came and joined themselves with David, some bringing gifts, you know, and they wanted to be on the winning side. You know how it is. If somebody's winning, you want to be on that side. You don't want to be on the side where people are losing. Right. Um, and uh, he and his men, they killed a lot of them. Uh, they took their horses and chariots. And they, uh, I think they said they, they kept for themselves about a hundred of them. And they destroyed the rest so the enemy couldn't use it again against them. So now we come to our chapter, our chapter, 2 Samuel 9. <clears throat> While David was contemplating and remembering his friend Jonathan, he thought about it. I made a covenant with him. Right. And between them, and he sought to find out if there were any kindred of Saul still alive right. that he may show kindness to. Uh -huh. It was told of him of Saul's servant, Ziba. So David, he sent for Ziba. Uh, Ziba uh, explained to David that Jonathan had a son who was lame in the feet. David asked, where is he? And Ziba told him, he's in Lodibar the house of Meshach and the son of Amiel. Um, and no doubt he went on and telling the story how he got lame because as they were, the nurse was fleeing with him, she dropped him in and therefore he's now a cripple. So David asked for him to send him, send for him. But this uh, Mes Meshachar, He's the same one that showed David's kindness when David was on the run from his own son, Absalom. Right. David and his men. Uh, you remember I told you he was running from Saul. He was hiding in caves in the wilderness in different cities. 
But this particular guy, where Mosiba Beth, uh, pardon me, I'm sorry, was was that he was the same guy that showed kindness to right. David. Right. And David explained to uh, Mosiba that, bring him to me. I want to show him kindness. Um, so David sent for him, um, and uh, Ziba and his men brought him back. When he arrived, he bowed down to King David, and he told him, David told him, said, I will restore everything that your saw your grandfather had, and, uh, but you will reside with me, and you will eat at my table. David sent for him, and uh, Ziba once again, and told him, look, I need you to be over the house of Saul. I want you to, and your people to work the land and work the house. And so at that time, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Okay. So he had more than enough to till that land and keep it up. Um, and also there was advantage for Ziba. He and his family would have somewhere to stay continuously. Yeah. And, and yeah. they would have shelter and food. But uh, David uh, asked uh, Ziba, he said, I want you to work the land and I want you to bring forth fruit so Mephibosheth would have food to eat, but he will continuously eat at my table. All right. So actually that they, I guess when they work the land, they will sell the food and the proceeds, you know, would go to the owner. And then also at the same time, they would have provision and, and shelter. <clears throat> so Ziba agreed with all that David had commanded. He would do that he would do. Also have a uh, have a uh, Mephibosheth had a son. His name was Micah, uh, who will stay in the house with Ziba and his family. And that's basically um, what we have. So we must remember that we need to show kindness to people. We, we should be willing to model ourselves after David's attitude toward those who do us wrong. Don't try to get even with them. Right. Faith for them. Yeah. Okay? So we need to strengthen our relationship with God through prayer and meditation. And we, we must remember his kindness toward us. Um, Day, day by day, we have something to thank the Lord for. Amen. Because, you know, we have not always been so good yeah. and deserving of yeah. his kindness. And then we should also reflect on the times his mercy was extended to us instead of his justice. So, as I stated earlier, we have not always been so good that he just keeps on blessing us. He just keeps blessing us because he is that kind of God. Yeah. And we need to ex exemplify that same attitude toward others. Uh, treat people as you want to be treat treated. Go the extra mile, you know, um, to help someone. Uh, tell someone about the word of the Lord. Right. That they too right. know and will accept his goodness. Um, instead of walking in darkness, they too can walk in the light. That is all I have today. That is the extent of my overview. I hope something has been said that we can take with us and use in our daily life. And I thank you for the opportunity to share once again. And may you have a blessed Sunday. Uh, now don't go away because we have a dynamic message coming to us. Thank you.
sanctuary of the Great Emmanuel Baptist Church for our Sunday morning services. We welcome those of you that are here in person in the sanctuary with us, and those of you that join us via social media. We welcome you to this wonderful day of worship and praise. This is a day that the Lord has made. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to be very happy about it. And because a lot, of, a lot of things have been going on around our world and our country, but God has been good to us. And here we are, allowed to come into his house one more time. I'm going to ask those of you that's here in our sanctuary to stand with us for, as our musicians lead us in the open chorus of a worship song. But I'm also going to ask those of you that are viewing my social media. I know you're not here in person, but you stand up too. I mean, go ahead, wrap that bathrobe around you. Stand up on those body, uh, body slippers got on. But you stand with us and you join us in this time of worship. Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord 
bid him and took unto him his wife and knew not not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. I have just read to you from Matthew chapter 1 verse, verses 18 through 25. May the Lord add his blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his most holy word. Thank you very much. You may be seated at this time. I'm going to invite you to join me at this time for a word of prayer, please. Most Holy Father, Most Holy Father, Most Holy Father, I, I, I thank you this day that I can call you Father. Because there was a time when I was alienated from you because of sin. But because you so love me that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to be born in a stable, wrapped in strip of cloth, and laid in a manger just to save me from my sins, so that I would have the right, the privilege, the honor to call you Father. And this day, I call out to you, Father, with thanksgiving in my heart. Looking back over my shoulder at a week that has gone by, where you in your mercy and grace spared my life one more time. Where you in your mercy and your grace shielded me, protected me from all hurt, harm, and danger. Where you in your grace guided me safely over the danger of Provided for all of my needs, so I did not lack or want for nothing. And I just want to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for being so good, so kind, and so gracious to one such as I. And I thank you, Father, that you didn't do it because I was so good, because I was so kind. Because I was such a good little sweet Sunday school boy, but you did it because of your son Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. And now I want to thank you, Lord, for allowing me to come into your presence this Sunday morning to worship you and to praise you and to give you thanks. And I invite you into this service, Lord. I, I, I invite you in to have your way. Let your will be done. That you will anoint everything that we do this day. Anoint the reading of scripture. Anoint the praying of prayer. Anoint the singing of song. But most of all, I ask that you anoint the one who's going to stand behind this sacred desk to preach your uncompromising word. Declare your everlasting God. Have your way today, Lord.
That's the reason why we come here, is to worship the Lord. During the month of December, we always say Jesus is the reason for the season. But Jesus is the reason for every season. Summer, winter, spring, and fall. We need him all the time. May we please bow our heads for a word of prayer. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, once again, Lord, I come to you saying thank you. Father, I come to you as a sinner needing your help. Lord, you are the potter and I'm just the clay. Continuously to shape and mold me to be the man of God you've created me to be, Lord. Lord, give me the words to say to your people, Father. Lord, I'm just a mouthpiece, just a small vessel that's representing you, Father. But Lord, I ask you, Father, to let this word go through this building and touch someone who hasn't accepted Jesus as their Savior. Lord, I ask you, Father, to allow your spoken word to be inspiration, encouragement, Father, to all of us on today, Father. Lord, we thank you for being the light in our lives as we go out here, Father, and continuously meet people in this dark and toxic world. Father, we thank you and we love you. For us in Jesus' mighty strong name I pray. Let us all say amen, amen. and thank God. Amen. Giving all praise and adorations to our Heavenly Father. Giving all praise and adorations to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And giving respect to each of you all who are here on today. Truly, it's a privilege and honor to stand before you once again to bring you the good news about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. We'd like to thank Sister Pam Taylor for an awesome job on teaching the Sunday school on today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Brother Keith and leading us doing our praise and worship on today. Yeah. But not only that, we'd like to thank each and every one of you all who come down here Sunday in and Sunday out to teach Sunday school. And those of you who come down here to lead us in our worship and praise. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to thank the music ministry as well. We'd like to thank the media ministry. we just like to thank all of you for all that you are doing. Yeah. Because each and every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest, you are important to the Great Emmanuel Baptist Church. Yeah. And you are definitely important to the body of Christ. But I will not hold you too long on today. There is a word from God that he has given me in my heart. Would you please stand those who can and those who will. Open up your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, okay. chapter 12. I'll be commencing at verse 1, and I will conclude at verse 2. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12. I'll be commencing at verse 1, and I will conclude at verse 2. And when you have found it, please say amen. amen. It reads as follows. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, right. let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yep. Thus ends the reading of the word of God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yep. For God is good. God is alive and his spirit dwells in this place. Yep. For a subject on today, I want to talk to you about running the Christian race the right way. All right. Running the Christian race the right way. I pray that Hebrews chapter 12 blesses everyone on today. On this Christian race, all of us will experience some good days and some bad days. There's a right way and a wrong way to do anything. If we're honest with ourselves, all of us have done some things the right way and the wrong way. If we keep on being honest with ourselves, we are still, still doing some things the right way uh -huh. and the wrong way. Yeah. As believers in Jesus Christ, every decision we make is a reflection on the body of Christ. Amen. 
whether it's good or bad, right or wrong. Doing things the right way can bless us, or doing things the wrong way can set us backwards. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Nowhere in the Bible are we promised that the Christian life is going to be easy. Right. We will be tempted to quit on God and drop out of the race. Yeah, yeah. The Christians in Hebrews were enduring a terrible time of trial and persecution. For the author of Hebrews is trying to encourage these weary, hurting believers to be faithful to the Lord and continue to run their race the right way. Uh -huh. On today, I want to help you all to stay in the race. Yeah, yeah. I want to share some steps that are given in these two first verses that will help you and me run this race the right way. Okay. So if we're going to run the Christian race the right way, there are four things that we need to remember. The first thing we need to remember is we have inspiration for the race. Yeah, yeah. The second thing we need to remember is follow the instructions for the race. Uh -huh. The third thing we need to remember is do not imitate anyone doing the race. Okay. And the fourth and final thing we need to remember is there is an incentive at the end of the race. I call these the four eyes. Inspiration, instructions, imitate, and incentive. So first we see we have inspiration for the race. This is a picture of the race of life that is placed right before us. Now in verse 1, you see the word, word for. Now whatever in passage of scripture in the Holy Bible from Genesis to Revelation, whatever chapter, whatever verse you're coming from, whenever you see the word, word for, you have to ask yourself, what is it there for? The word word for in verse 1, it takes us back to what the Hebrew author told us in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. Now the author inspires these Hebrew Christians to have faith in Christ and to run the Christian race, uh, the, run the Christian life as an athlete runs a track race. The author also draws our attention back to chapter 11 where he mentions many of the great heroes of faith. Now, he refers to them as cloud of witnesses. Okay. These great heroes of faith, these cloud of witnesses, surround us as we run the race we have been given. Right. Now, many of you all, including myself, uh, we saw the Olympic Games a few months ago. Right. Uh, and during the track and field competition, you notice that there were people in the stands from all over the world. And they were cheering for those track and field participants who were running the race. Right. And us as Christians, this is what the Hebrew writer is telling us. As we were running the race, those cloud of witnesses, they're in the stands cheering us on. Right. They're telling us to keep going. Come on. Don't give up, my brother and sister. Right. Now, these Old Testament saints ran the race they had been given. Okay. They didn't run perfect all the time, but they ran it. They didn't quit until the race was finished. Now, they endured pain. I'm sure there was some crying, and I know that there was some suffering. But guess what? They still ran. They stand tall now, observing as we run this Christian race the right way. If they could run their race, guess what? You and I can run this race too. These saints were ordinary common men and women who had a strong faith in God. They left off the scene, and we're on the scene to run the race. This should give us encouragement. This should inspire us to run for the Lord. Yeah. We have brothers and sisters in Christ we never met before. Uh -huh. We have brothers and sisters in Christ we never spoke to before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We read about them in our passage of scripture, and yet they're cheering us on. Uh -huh. Someone may be wondering right now, what is their witness? Every one of them is saying to the Christian contender, you're on the right track. Uh -huh. That's their witness yeah. to inspire us. They have shown us that God is reliable during this race. They're saying if he was reliable for me during the race, he showed up as reliable for you on this race. If God took care of them, honored their faith, sustained them, kept them, used them, blessed them, and got the glory from their lives, guess what? He can take care of us. He'll honor our faith, sustain us, keep us, use us, and bless us the same way he did them. So we're surrounded with a cloud of men and women who have a strong testimony to bear to us regarding this race. I can hear someone saying, Reverend Robinson, who are these cloud of witnesses? Well, if you look at chapter 11, the author gives us a few names. He says Abel, 
Enoch, yeah. Noah, yeah. Abraham, yeah. Moses, yeah. Joseph, yeah. and all the other named and unnamed heroes of faith listed, or some of them are not listed in chapter 11 of Hebrews. There were men and women who are heroes of faith. They are not spectators. They are champions. They are winners. They should inspire us to hang on in the race. When things show up, brothers and sisters, because there's going to be some things show up. There's going to be some things show up tomorrow. There's going to be some things that show up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then next Sunday. When problems come from your left, when problems come to your right, when problems hit you in your face in the front, when problems hit you in the back of your head in the back, remember, their lives are examples to us to run the Christian race well with inspiration. Just like the Old Testament saints are an inspiration to us, we must inspire ourselves. Yeah. You know, sometimes you got to inspire and encourage yourself. Yeah. But not only must we inspire and encourage ourselves, we have to inspire others who are in this race. Yeah. Because all of us are not on the same level. But just because we're not on the same level doesn't mean that we're better than the next one. No, we have to lift each other up and inspire each other and say, brother and sister, keep going. And another thing, my brothers and sisters, we have to stop being so hard on ourselves. Stop talking down on yourself. Stop saying that you are not nothing. No, you are somebody in Jesus Christ. Be inspired by your cloud of witnesses and stay positive during your race. So the second thing we need to remember if we're going to run the Christian race the right way, follow the instructions for the race. I never shall forget I was in seminary class, and, and the teacher did something that really stuck out to me. He passed us out a piece of paper. He passed us out a worksheet when we first walked into the class. And, and what happened was all of us, we put our name on a piece of paper, and we began to start filling out the questions. But what we, what we, what, but what we failed to do is we did not follow the instructions on the paper. The instructions on the paper said, put your name on there, and that's it. But not only did we put our name on there, we began to answer the questions. And then Stoker chuckled. He said, all of y'all got it wrong. We said, well, how did we get it wrong, Professor? He said, because you all did not read the instructions. The instructions said, put your name on there, but do not answer the questions. If we're going to run the race the right way, we must follow the instructions for the race. Follow the instructions for the race remind us that we're not here dealing with a 40 yard dash. We're not here dealing with a 50 yard dash. We're not even here dealing with a 100 yard dash meter. This is a long grind. The author gives us three instructions in the text to follow for the race. The first instruction is to lay aside every weight. This refers to a runner making sure that all extra weights have been removed from his or her body. I don't know about you all, but no one wants to be tied down when he or she runs a race. Yeah. No one wants to be wearing heavy and uncomfortable, and uncomfortable clothes running. Right. It's hard to run a race with weights on your back and weights on your legs. On. To reach our goal in the race, we must lay aside all weight. Uh -huh. We have to take everything off that's dragging you down. So you can run the race unhindered. A weight is anything that takes away the spiritual sensitivity in all of our hearts. Now, what we've got to understand is it may be comfortable for someone else to do this, but for Christians running the race, it takes the edge off our spiritual lives. It can cut our hunger from God and the spoken word. It holds us back. Why? Because it's a weight. For some of them, their way is seeking entertainment instead of fellowship with God. Yeah. For others, their attention is to music, TV shows, movies that do not focus their minds and hearts on Jesus Christ. Yeah. Anything that does not build you up in the Lord is a weight and a hindrance. Yeah. All of us must lay aside the weights in our lives. God never removes anything from our lives unless he gives us something better to replace our lives. Yeah. God never cheats us. Yeah. He is not a taker. Uh -huh. He is a giver. As we lay aside the weight, he replaces it with something better. We lay aside dead weights by committing them to the Lord and dedication to his service. So our second instruction is the sin which don't so easily beset us. We are encouraged to get rid of the sins that cling on to us. Sins that distract us and trips us during this race. 
Sin is the rebellion and violation of the laws of God. Sin means to miss the mark. And all of us have missed the mark many times. But we have to lay aside our sins by confessing it, by bringing it up to God, by giving it up to him, by saying, Lord, I was wrong. Father, forgive me, Lord. Lord, I didn't think about that the right way. I didn't say that the right way, Lord. Father, church, my heart. When we confess our sins to God, we claim his forgiveness. Every way carries a beset sin. This is the sin that stands around within every striking distance. It holds on to you, and it keeps on tripping you. Now, it's like a long flowing garment that is wrapped around your body, and it's tied. How many of y'all have, have ever rolled? have ever put on a long robe or a long trench coat. And when you was walking, it was dragging. This is what a beset scene is. If you and I run the race with a long robe and a long trench coat on, it will easily trip us and we'll fall out of the race. That's what sin does to us. It clings on to us. It grows long and then it trips us up and we fall. So all of us have these sins that trips us up. God knows when we're weak. You know where you're weak at. I know where I'm weak at. There are sins that do, not, that do not tempt us at all. But there are others that are constant at us. Whatever your sin is, it must be ripped off. It must be stripped off and avoided at all costs. I don't know about you all, but I was watching the old Superman television show yesterday morning. You know, I love to get up early in the morning when everybody else is asleep. It's just something about early in the morning, y'all. Getting up early talking to the Lord. But I find myself watching an old Superman clip. And one thing that I love about Clark Kent was that when he had on that suit, and when he gets ready to turn into Superman, he rips it off like this. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, if, if we are going to run the race the right way and follow the instructions, there's some sin that we got to rip off, just like Clark Kent. So we see now our third instruction is to run with patience the race that is set before us. This is a test of endurance, something that demands staying with or staying under. This is a picture of a runner settling in for the long haul. Uh -huh. If we run a race, we run. We do not jog. Yeah. You don't walk on a race. Yeah. You don't trot. But we run. Uh -huh. See, we can't sit still. We can't just drift along. There's a race to be run. The only way we can achieve our goal of the race is to run. Yeah. See, there is an intensity about running. It requires energy for us to move forward. We can't afford to be looking back. We can't stop because there is a goal right before us. The race must still be run. We must run it with dedication and we must run it with commitment. We must run with all our strength and with all of our might. We have a goal to pursue. The Christian life it's not a passive life, but an active life, yeah. an energetic life, and it's going to sometimes be a tough life. Yeah. The author tells us the kind of flow we must run in the race. Yeah. So what kind of flow do we need to run in the race, y'all? We need to run a flow of patience. Yeah. He says run with patience. He doesn't say run stressed out. Hmm. He doesn't say run worried about your problems. Hmm. He doesn't say run grudgingly, but he says run with patience. Yeah. How can we run a patiently? in this toxic, dark, and evil world. Yeah. If we're going to be patient, how can we run? For the word patient means persistent. He says you need to have a persistent flow if you're going to run the Christian race. Yeah. It means that we ought to reach out, not to stop halfway before we reach our goal. Yeah. We ought to finish the race. We have to stand strong in the Lord and run his race. Yeah. Now many of y'all heard. Right. You remember Florence Griffin John? Flow Joe. You remember Carl Lewis, yeah. Michael Johnson? All three of those individuals, they were the fastest during their era. Yeah. And they ran for the United States of America. Right. Yeah. You remember Usain Bolt? He ran for the Jamaicans. Right. He was one of the fastest men in the world for the past eight, nine, ten years. Right. But one thing that really stood out to me when they ran their race is that they always represented the country that they ran for. <laughs> Flo Jo, Carl Lewis. Michael Johnson ran for the United States. Yeah. Usain Bolt ran for the Jamaicans. But the Christians on our race, we run for God, y'all. <laughs> we run for somebody who gives us strength. We run for somebody when we get weak, he props us 
back up. See, the child of God runs for God. The Christian runner has some endurance and a little grind as well. See, you don't have to run a 4 4 for God. <laughs> you don't have to run a 4 point 3 flat for God. God is concerned about your voice. He's concerned about your endurance and your stamina in the race. So we have, we, see, we have to have the same dedication and intensity just like those Olympic runners. See, it's not for us to decide how to run. It's not for us to decide the speed of our race. We are not giving CPR to a dummy. We are involved with living people. We need to call men and women to repentance before it's too late. We must keep running with patience and persistence until we have finished our course. See, brothers and sisters, we have to run with patience the race that is set before us. But what is set before us? We have our own lanes to run. We have our own race to run. See, you can't run in my lane, and I can't run in your lane. We're on the same team. We're not in competition with each other. See, when I pass the baton to you, you pass it to the other believer. Yeah. <laughs> and we're on the same team. See, my job isn't to outrun you. My job is to run for Jesus. The race that he has planned for me to be the best that I can be and the best of my ability. See, the race that you are running has to be prepared just for you. See, run your race the best of your God-given ability. So the third thing that we have to remember if we're going to run the Christian race the right way is do not intimidate anyone else doing the race. It's good to learn from other people. Amen. It's good to learn knowledge from, from other people. Amen. I never shall forget there was a commercial coming up in the early 90s. It was a Gatorade commercial and Michael Jordan was the main person on the commercial. They said if I could be like Mike. And one thing that I discovered my mother told me, because I asked her for a pair of Jordans, and she said, John, those shoes cost over $100. Oh. She said, I'm a single mother. And she said, have you ever thought about that Michael Jordan is not going to pick up the phone if you call him? <laughs> she said, matter of fact, he's not even going to give you his telephone number. Yeah. She said, you probably will never meet Michael Jordan. Uh -huh. She said, if you're going to be like somebody, son, you need to be like Jesus. Yeah. Because you can call him in the middle of the night. <laughs> you can call him in the wee hours of the morning. But we mess up when we start trying to sing like other people. We mess up when we start trying to preach like other preachers. We mess up when we start trying to teach like other teachers. We mess up when we start trying to walk like other people. Talk like other people doing the race. For verse 2 informs us who we should be intimidating. We are to look unto Jesus as the pattern for our lives. For the word looking teaches us to put things into the proper perspective. Yeah. We got to put things in proper perspective. Yeah. See, man will let you down, but Jesus will always be around. Yeah. We ought to look up to him during our situations as he see our suffering in regards to him. When we run, we are to run looking unto Jesus. Jesus must be our main focal point while we run in this race. Yeah. We look to Jesus. We must, intimidate, we must imitate Jesus because he ran his race. And he ran the race with He finished what God laid out in front of him. Jesus is our author. It refers to the one who leads a procession. It refers to the captain. He is the race judge. He is the finisher. He is the one who calls the race. And he will decide who is disqualified and who was running the race well to judgment day. While we run, we can't try to be like other runners. We must not look at the other runners while we're running. Looking at the other runners will distract us and allow us to easily be defeated. Yeah. Our eyes must be on our author and finisher of, of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's the one who started us on the race and the one who will get, greet us at the end. Yeah. He is the leader of our faith. He is the perfecter of it. And keep living on to him. Yeah. Jesus' race was hard race that began in poverty uh -huh. and ended pain on the Roman cross. Yeah. Yeah. His race led him around a tract of hatred Betrayal and bitterness. I want to let you all know, if you don't follow Jesus, if you don't imitate Jesus, then you're going to be going around a track of hatred. Yeah. You're going to run around a track of betrayal. Yeah. And you're going to run around a track of bitterness. But his race was a perfect example of how we should run this race. He never complained, even though we still complain. He never lost sight of the goal. Sometimes we get tripped up in the race. He never quit running until the goal was achieved. So when you feel like quitting, Give it up. Frustrated and angry, 
Just look to Jesus and think about the race he ran for you and I. So before I take my seat, there is an incentive at the end of the race. Our great pattern, our great finisher, our great author, our great captain, Jesus Christ had an incentive for his race. He ran for the joy that was set before him. So one may be saying right now, where's the joy in going to a cross? Someone else may be asking, where's the joy in dying and being treated like a criminal? Yeah. Someone else may be asking, where's the joy in being rejected by people you love? Uh -huh. Someone else may ask the question, where's the joy in dying for the entire world? Yeah. Jesus' joy was in what happened when he finished his race. Yeah. For Jesus, the joy was the day of redemption that brought salvation to all mankind. Yeah. Jesus ran because he was able to see past the cross, look beyond the cross, and defeat the cross. He was able to despise even the shame. Yeah. He saw us on the cross. Amen. He saw our ugly sins on the cross. But I don't know about you all, but these two words, joy and cross, don't seem to go together to me. The cross speaks of pain. It speaks of suffering. It speaks of ridicule, rejection, and public humiliation. Yeah. Crucifixion was a slow, agonizing death that sometimes lasted for days. Uh -huh. But what I love about it, Jesus did not enjoy the cross. He did not enjoy shame. He did not enjoy rejection. He did not enjoy public humiliation. But he still ran his race for us. We motivated Jesus to run his race. We motivated the heart of Jesus to go to the cross and die. And guess what? Jesus ran so well. And when he finished, his incentive at the end of the race was he sat down at the right end of the throne of God. Jesus knew where he was headed. That made it a lot easier to run the race. It's challenging. And difficult sometimes to look beyond our situations in life. Yeah, yeah. But we must strive and try to come to a place where we're able to look beyond our situations and challenges of life and think about the day when we will come home with Jesus. On, I don't know about you all, but sometimes when I'm asleep, huh? I think about eternal life. Yeah. Sometimes when I sleep, I think about no more death when I get to hell. Sometimes when I sleep, I get excited because there's going to be no more suffering. When I'm sleeping, I wake up. I say, it ain't going to be no more hatred. Yeah. I have a heavenly vision that makes the race more bearable for me. Yeah. See, when we're on the race, we got to always think about heaven and what lies in front of us. Yeah. But do we really know this incentive that's in our great race of life as well? Uh -huh. Do you think about it from time to time? Do you talk about your incentive from time to time? Yeah. I encourage every believer in Jesus Christ to continue following Jesus and carry your own cross. Because when you carry a cross, there's some pain and there's some gain. There will be no pain and no gain. There's going to be some suffering and some glory. There's going to be no suffering and no glory. There's a no cross but no crown. No tears, no joy. Everyone likes to empty tomb, but we have to decide before we can rise again. While staring at death at any time, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy quoted on his race. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Yeah. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, laying up for me a crown of righteousness. Uh -huh. With the Lord, the righteous judge, to give me at that day. Yeah. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about you all, but when our race ends, Jesus will tell every believer. First of all, he's going to congratulate you by saying, well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he's going to recognize you by saying, thou good and faithful servant. Yeah, yeah. Then he's going to promote you by saying, you've been faithful over three things. Yeah. Come on up high where I can make you ruler over many things. But guess what, brothers and sisters? It doesn't stop there. Jesus tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I'm set down with my father in his throne. See, Jesus will give us an elevated level of personal experience with him doing that day. What an awesome God we serve. He was born to our dead mother. He was born in a stable. Yeah. He was born to poor parents. Yeah. His life was threatened as a baby. Yeah. His birth was caused of a terrible suffering. Yeah. He was moved as a baby. Yeah. He was raised in a, in, in a despicable town called Nazareth. Yeah. His father died when he was young. Yeah. He had to support his own family. Yeah. He had no home and no place to lay his head. Yeah. He was hated and opposed by others. Yeah. He was charged with insanity. He was charged with demon possession. He was betrayed by a close friend. He was arrested and tried in courts for treason. He was marched to a hill called Calvary, 
carrying a cross made of trees. I don't know about you all, but I'm glad that Jesus went to Calvary. When they got him to Calvary, they stressed him why they hung him high. But that's not the end of the story. See, Jesus had to end the race by, by coming down and being buried in Joseph on Mandela's tomb. It didn't look good Friday, y'all. It didn't look good on Saturday, y'all. But something happened between Saturday night and early Sunday morning. Jesus ran the race way well by getting up early Sunday morning. Amen. Run the Christian race Amen. the right way. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you yeah, right. is my prayer. Amen. And I want to leave you with something. What kind of race are you running right now? Are you still in the race? Have you thrown in the tile on the race? But I want to encourage you to hang in there because you can run the race the right way. Amen. students of the Roosevelt High School, you may not be aware of it, but they have recently resurfaced their football field with an artificial turf. And, and, and before they started work on it, because see now, before they started work on it, you could, you could go up there and go around the track and I gotta figure out some way to get on that artificial turf just for the fun of it. But I remember the first time that I did go up there, I was gonna go around the track. But I but, but you know from a distance things look different than they do look close up. When I finally got up there and got on the track and I saw how long that track was and I said I'm too old for this. I don't know how Reverend Hudson did it, but I'm too old for this. You see, what got me off was I was looking at the track and not the finish line. You see, so many times we desire to live for the Lord, but when we get to looking at the road to the Christian life instead of looking at the one at the finish line of the Christian life. So if, if you want to make it through this Christian life, don't look at the track. Look at the one at the finish line of the track. And, 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 and if you want to, to join this Christian race, you have to, you have to recognize that it's, that it's not only finishing with Jesus, but it also starts with Jesus. Where you're willing to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And then you get on the Christian track. And then Jesus stands at the finish line and says, Come on, come on. So today, as a musician, play softly. If you have never been this one who hung, bled, and died on Calvary's cross just to save you from your sin. Today is your opportunity. Today is your opportunity. I, I would let this opportunity pass me by. I would come, get on my knees at Jesus, confess my sins to him, ask him to forgive me, invite him to my feet of my heart as my Lord and Savior. You can do that today, wherever you are. You don't have to be here in the same but if you're in the same prayer and you want to come forward and receive Christ, we'll be waiting for you. But, but if you're out there viewing us, this body of men, where you are, pray that there's Christ to come into your heart. Please do it while you can. Because our preacher mentioned the Olympic Games, but did you know that just as they had the opening of, of the Olympic Games, they had the closing of the Olympic Games. And then when the game was over with, it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't no time to run the, the track anymore. It wasn't no time.
time to, to strive for reward. Guess what you had to do? You had to wait another four years for the game to come back. But when this life is over with, there is no second chance to come back and run the race. Why?
our church, we're doing time and offering. Some of you have brought it with you on Sunday morning. Others of you have driven by and, and uh, dropped it off. Others of you took the time to put it in the mailbox. Then others of you have taken advantage of our electronic giving to uh, share with your tithes and all. But however you gave, we want to just say thank you. We just want to we just want to thank you for your faithfulness. And if everyone has had an opportunity to give, may you allow me to thank God for these tithes and offerings. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to show our love to you through these tithes and offerings that we've given. We pray that you will bless us as we obey your word to give, but also bless these tithes and offerings and use them for the purpose for which they've given, the ongoing work of your kingdom here on this earth through this local assembly. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, good morning again. We're still in the morning hour. Couple of announcements. A couple of announcements. Good to see all of you out today, and thank you all for joining in with us on our worship service on today. We have truly, we have truly been blessed, and I want to thank um, all of you all that made this possible. I want to thank Sister Pam for this morning for a wonderful Sunday school. Amen. I like that research that you did. I, I like that. I love that. Uh, you went well back and pulled something out of there that it didn't see some history that I did not know, and I thank you for that. So thank you for your continued research and dialogue. Thank you so much. Reverend Robson, thank you for those four eyes this morning. Mm -hmm. We realize that S-I-N and I is in the middle, and that's what's causing us not to run this race correctly. So thank you for those four eyes on this morning and your continued uh, work. Thanks to our video tech this morning. We have a substitute working with us this morning. Uh, thank you, Sister Quantum, for your your, 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 your dedication on today. And then I don't know if you all have this chance to look around and look at the camera and pick it up, these decorations done by the OG Hudson yeah. ministry. We want to thank them for that. Make it look so beautiful and bright here on today. Also from the OG Hudson uh, ministry, we have an announcement along with your help, the sponsors of the Angel Tree, on Sunday, December the 19th, at the end of the service, uh, the child or the youth must be in attendance. All right, so on next Sunday, the child or the youth must be in attendance. We are asking for a donation of $30 to purchase the gift cards for our children and youth. Parents, children, name, and age must be given to Sister Brenda Jennings. All right, 214-418-8624 by Thursday, December the 16th. Thanks in advance, O.G. Jean Hudson Ministry. I hope you got that. Okay. Turn that in by Sister Jennings. Thursday, December the 16th. All right? Thanks to the Lord Hudson Ministry. Also, all right, that's better. The Youth Back to Worship Service has been set. The Youth Back to Worship Service has been set. We're going to welcome our youth back. Yes, the youth, the children, the young adults, the Youth Back to Worship Service, Sunday, January the 16th, Sunday school and worship time. Listen, we need all of you to make this a powerful worship service rendered to God. Choir rehearsals have been set right after the service on December the 19th and January the 9th, so we can get ready, get ready, get ready to get back to worship in the house of the Lord. Right. Great Emmanuel Youth Department. Thank you all for that. Also, a couple other announcements. Uh, in recognition 
on last week, I failed to do it on last week, and I want to make sure I did it this week. I thank God for uh, preserving and giving me another opportunity. Uh, Sister Jackson, it's good to see you back. I missed that on last week. Forgive me. It's good to see you back with all you ever do, and we thank God for you on today. Uh, let's pray for our neighbors in uh, the area of Kentucky and all those areas where the tall neighbors here. Let's continue to pray for those uh, areas, and then continue to pray for all of our sick and shut here at Great Evangelism. And also, a special prayer, uh, if you get a chance, pray for Sister Richards Terry. Uh, she's uh, declining, ha has declined in health, so continue to pray for her. Sister Ned's services will be uh, 17th and 18th. The 17th and 48th visitation at Golden Gate, 18th uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, at Golden Gate as well as a service on the 18th. So continue to pray for these uh, as we continue to pray for you. Uh, now we have a prayer for our uh, search committee. Thank you all. We can. My God, Sister Verde Wright has slipped in here. God bless you. Good to see you, Sister Verde Wright. I did not see you. God bless you. And thank all of you. See, we're coming back. So next week, next week we tend to see you. We want to see you back on next week. God bless you. Thank you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious Father God, Lord, we just thank you for just all you've done for us, Lord. All this week, oh Lord, we thank you for just being there through all of our circumstances and situations, Lord. Because, Lord, we know if we lean on you, you'll pull us through, Lord. Lord, we pray in advance for what you're going to do for us this coming week, oh Lord. Lord, we just ask that you can continue to let your mercy and grace come down and be a part of our lives, oh Lord. But sometimes we take it for granted, oh Lord. But, Lord, we just thank you right now, Lord. We had a thousand tongues, Lord. We couldn't thank you enough, oh Lord. And Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, that you just continue to shine on great Emmanuel, Lord. Help us, oh Lord, as we get ready to open up, oh Lord, that we may be, be pleasing to you, oh Lord. Not ourselves, oh Lord, but that we may keep you in mind and know that it's all for you, oh Lord. Oh Father God, I just thank you for being the great God that you are, Lord. I thank you, oh Lord, for being a bridge during troubled times, oh Lord. Lord, I just thank you right now, Lord, for just looking over the sick and the shut in, oh Lord. As they go through their situations, oh Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with them, oh Lord. Lord, I just ask right now, Lord, that you let your Holy Spirit dominate our spirit, oh Lord, that we may continue to do your will and not our will, oh Lord. And that your will may be first in our lives in everything that we do, O oh Lord. Oh, Father God, I pray right now as the chairman spoke about those families in Kentucky and you know, that area where the tornado and all hit, O oh Lord. Lord, I just pray that you comfort them, be with them, O oh Lord. Touch them, O oh Lord, in a mighty, mighty way, Lord. Because we know through all things you can do the impossible, O oh Lord. Lord, we just pray right now again, O oh Lord, that you just touch most of us here, Lord, that know you as a good God, oh Lord, that we may continue to, to grow at whatever level we're at, oh Lord. Whatever level we may be, Lord, all of us are not on the same level, oh Lord. But Lord, I'm just asking that you continue to carry us, Lord, to the next level, oh Lord. Lord, if it just be in our health, oh Lord. Lord, if it just continue to be in our finances, oh Lord. Lord, we just continue to be in your ministry and learning your word, oh Lord. I pray right now, Lord, that you just take us to that next level, oh Lord. Lord, that level where we, we don't know at times what's going to happen, but we know if we keep our mind focused on you, it'll always be all right, oh Lord. Lord, I continue to just ask you, oh Lord, that you just touch me, oh Lord. Help me to grow more and more and stay in your word, oh Lord. Lord, Put me, I have to put me to my knees, oh Lord. Just help me to do what you want me to do, oh Lord. And then, Lord, I'll be your servant, Lord. Lord, I thank you this day, oh Lord, for just being in my life, oh Lord, for teaching me every day how to grow in the way you need me to grow, Lord. Lord, help me to surrender all to you, oh Lord. Be with me, Father God. And Lord, I just thank you the message that was sent today by Reverend R. John, oh Lord. Lord, that we all may be able to know where we stand with you, Lord, and that we just could 
continue to let you work in our lives. Yeah. Help us in our homes, oh Lord, because our children need guidance and they need growth to go to be and do things that you want us to do, Lord. Because, Lord, if we put it in their hearts, Lord, they'll go at some time and go back to that way if they went astray, oh Lord. Lord, we need you. We can't go without you, Lord. This is a precious and God in the name of your son. Oh Lord, don't let me forget. Pray for us, oh Lord. Be with us, oh Lord. As we get the pastoral committee, oh Lord. Lord, you know we're looking for a pastor, Lord. There's nothing I can say that you don't know, Lord. But we're just asking that you continue to guide us and lead us in your ways, oh Lord. Not our ways, Lord. Set our ways aside, oh Lord, and focus on you and what you want us to do, oh Lord. Keep us in that way, oh Lord. Let your mind be put in each and every one of our minds that are in there. And that we may be speaking for you, Lord, so that we can bring in the right shepherd, oh Lord. The one that's going to love you more and more. And then lead and guide us as a sheep, oh Lord, that we won't go astray. These are all things I pray in the precious and the name of your son, Jesus Christ. This is his name I say.